Microphone? Oh, I'm on. There I am. All right. Apparently, the enemy does not want this message to go out. So, well, uh, I, had a, I had a really good week. I was really expecting uh, some kind of attack after getting this message uh, from Pastor Mike saying, could you open the series up? And I was like, sure, send me out in the front line. Yeah, thanks a lot, buddy. Uh, had a birthday this week. So this is what 62 looks like. Come on, bring those whistles, yeah. There you go. No, I've really had it. I've had a great week. I'm like, I'm pumped this morning. I'm really energetic, which does not fare well for you guys. I, I got to tell you. I'm, I'm, but um, yeah, we're opening this series up about spiritual warfare. And, you know, I... I, I rode through my Rolodex of humor to start off with a joke, uh, but I didn't have one, so I'm just going to go, all right? So if the jokes come out, they come out. If they don't, well, well, we're just going to teach. How's that? Let's try that novel approach. Um, I, I, I just want to share with you, it's important to understand uh, that we're not the church. If you're looking for the church, we're not the church that's going to cast demons out of benches and every chicken and dog that comes walking through, we're not going to do that because we're not going to focus on the enemy. This whole series is informing you about what the enemy's doing so that you don't get your focus off of Jesus. Can I get a good amen on that? Okay. So as long as we're clear on that, I'm just going to open us up in prayer, and we're going to dive right in. You ready to dive in? I got a lot of information. Your handout is both front and back if you got one, so... I'm going to get rolling. I might go fast, but strap in. Here we go. Father God, we praise you and thank you for just your word that illuminates and gives us insights into what is going on in the unseen realm, that we, we don't often get a picture of it. We, we walk in a physical world, Lord, but there are uh, things going on in the spiritual world that are both trying to trip us up and draw us away from your kingdom work, your calling on our lives, and most of all, your love for us. That, that we are doing life because of you, the great creator. We're doing life here, and we can be redeemed and restored and saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. Help us to never lose our focus on that, but help us to understand how the enemy operates so that when he does try to distract us, that we can identify it for what it is, a distraction from what the kingdom work is all about. And that's you, King Jesus. And it's in that name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to start off by talking to you about the households of God. And yes, households, I said it plurally, because Jesus is the creator of all things seen and unseen. Seen and unseen. Colossians 1.16 illuminates that truth for us right away. For by him, Jesus Christ, all things were created. Yes, a lot of us think that God was the creator, God the Father was the creator, but God the Father is the planner, orchestrator of all things. Jesus is actually the one who created. So for by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Say that, all created for Jesus. Say it, for Jesus. For Jesus. Everything's created for him. You see, but even before he started to form us, you see that list of things he created, visible and invisible, things we can't see. And we're just not talking about microscopic things, though he did create all those things. It also gives us a list, thrones, dominions, rulers, or authorities. These are part of the spiritual creation as well. These are names and identifications of, of the spirit realm. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Just hang on. I'm not going to get ahead of myself here. Because I wanted you to understand there was an order of creation. And if you do the Bible reading wrap-up, if you do uh, the daily Bible reading, you got to Job 38 this past week, and Job 38 actually give us, gave us some illumination about 
the order of creation. So Job 38, 4 through 7 says this. Uh, let, me give, let me give you this setup. 37 verses, Job, if you know, uh, gets uh, infirmed by the enemy. Satan comes in, says, Jesus says, what about Job? And my servant, he says, well, you know, you can do anything you want to him, just don't kill him. So he does, he, his whole family gets killed, except his wife. I never understood that. Killed his whole family, but left his wife there. That speaks volumes. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just kidding. So, but he, he, he um, he's he's laying there. He's 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 uncomfortable, and he he's got sores and boils. Lost all his fortune, and his three friends come and sit with him for seven days. Great friends who sit in silence while you're suffering. But then they went on for multiple chapters of, well, you must have done something bad. You must stink, Job. You must be awful. You must be terrible. They went on for multiple chapters, all three of them. And then Job gets a chance to answer, and he says, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I didn't do it. I, I, I'm righteous before God. I know I've done the right thing. You guys don't know anything. Then another friend comes in and tries to square everything away. And then God gets a chance to speak to Job, you know, you've been spouting off, you've been cursing the day you were born, and now God gets a chance to speak. And here's what God says. That was a real Reader's Digest version. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars together, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So here's a picture of God preparing to create the earth, preparing to create everything that's on the earth. And while he's doing that, while he's creating, he says, the morning stars sang together, and the sons of God shouted for joy. This is a group of the household of God that was created. You could call them angelic beings, but there's really this ranking, the sons of God and other beings that are part of God's divine counsel that we see in other portions of Scripture, that God has a divine counsel. Yes, he does. He doesn't need a divine counsel, but he has one. So we can talk about that another time. That's a whole other lesson, and I'm not going to get into that. Come on Wednesday night. You can ask any question you want. We'll go down every bunny trail. But he has this divine counsel, and he refers to them as sons of God. Now, morning stars are often a category of angelic beings. So the morning stars, so look at it this way. Sons of God shouted for joy. God's counsel rejoiced. And the morning stars, the angels sang. This is while God was creating the earth. So they were already there. Already created. All of the divine beings in heaven, all of those categories, whether rulers or thrones or authorities or powers, all created before God even said, let there be light. All created ahead of time. So they're already there. So he creates first a family of heavenly hosts. The creator of all things seen and unseen. And then he creates a family of heavenly hosts. Yes, he has this family of heavenly hosts. But then, but then he creates humans. He creates people. He creates them. Genesis 126, he says, then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created us as his special creation. We were created to be part of God's family. And we know that because Jesus walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. That was part of his residence on earth, the garden, a special place. We can get into all the characteristics of that. Again, don't have time to get into all that. I'm just trying to give you an understanding of how God created, what the spiritual divine realm is made up of, 
in how we are actually a part of it. But we were given dominion. We were given dominion over these things. So you have a little, if you have a handout, you have a little triangle there. And so at first at the top of the triangle, you have God Almighty. God Almighty is at the top of everything. He's the, he's the planner. He's the, he's, the, he's the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He is the creator. He is the author of all everything that is created. He's at the top of it. But then there's this other category, this secondary category that functions within the council of God, that functions within the, the heavenly realms, that functions up there called the sons of God, and also cherubs fall into that category. And the reason I put them in there, and we're going to understand in a minute when we get to those verses, but cherubs are the keepers of the throne. Keepers of the throne of God. You can understand why they would be in the council room. Because God's throne is there. And they are standing right there next to the throne of God in any time the council is together before Almighty God. So they're in that category, that, that subcategory of divine beings that's obviously under the creator, but above angels and thrones and rulers and powers and dominions. There's this whole category of angels. There's this, this, we call them messengers. The Hebrew word is malak. The, the Greek word is angelos. And within there, they're, they're, both words translate as messengers. They're messengers of God. And sometimes they're worshiping and praising. And sometimes they're, they're coming down and they're giving messages from God. And we see angelic beings throughout Scripture coming and doing various things uh, for the kingdom of God. When God wants to communicate, sometimes he sends Gabriel, sometimes Michael. You see that in, in all of these things. Though I think that those are in the sons of God category, but we can have that discussion another time. But angelic beings come down before mankind and interact. And they're a certain category. And so when we get to some of these questions in life, Pastor Mike asked a question this morning at the first service. We have a gathering of our leaders here. Pastor Mike always gives us a, a great short word that when all our leaders, all our volunteers come in together and they set up and we have a word. Pastor Mike gave out a, a, just a great word about how does, how does the enemy uh, trip you up? How does the enemy work in you? So I'll ask you guys the same exact question. What, what, where do you see the enemy working in your life? Just say it. Technology? Yeah. What was the other one? He isolates you. Well, we're glad you're here with the family. What is it? Lures? Are you back at the fishing hole? He lures us. How does he do that? Deception? Give me something specific. Physically, is that like lust? No? Suffering, okay. Ungodly, you changed your answer from this morning, didn't you? Yeah, you did, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's always tomorrow? That's a deception? Because it might not be, right? Wow, that's deep. We'll have to talk. <laughs> Dan's pointing. Material, yeah, materialism, yeah. Deception in the media, that never happens. All right, yeah, those are all good answers. Yeah, but it's re it's, these are all uh, reasons, actually, why people question God. We're here in church, we're the family of God, we're throwing out the same reasons how the enemy distracts us, but these are all reasons why people question why God even exists, right? They say, why is there death? So you just said, nobody's promised tomorrow. We, we've come to the place where we understand that death is possibility, because it's not even a possibility, it's an inevitability. Why is there death, they say. There can't be a God if there's death. And people say, why is there war? We just talked about all the un, unheaval, uh, upheaval in the world, right? But war isn't just international, geopolitical. It's also internal, isn't it? Yeah, you talked about suffering. 
kind of a war do you have with yourself when you're hurting, when you're in pain, when you're struggling? Yeah, we all have wars, internal wars, about how good we are. How, how you know, why, why don't I look as good as Pastor Mike? Because I don't go to the gym, that's why. What did you say? My new best friend. Thank you. Now I don't know what to do with myself. I'm embarrassed. All right. Okay. Good thing my wife's in kids' church today. Um, and why is there evil? There's so much evil in the world. There's, there's, there's darkness. There's evil. We, we hear of evil. People talk evil about us. People say bad things. We say bad things about people. Well, bless her heart. Right? We end it with something good, but we're saying something dark. We do it all the time. We get distracted and people say, well, you're a Christian, but you still do all the same things. And people question the existence of God. And this is all part and a result of the rebellions that took place in the spiritual realm. Interconnected with the physical realm. See, Christians always point to the Garden of Eden. And you're right to point there because that is a rebellion that happened against God in the physical but it was an interact action with the spiritual. And I think we all understand that. But the garden is only part of the answer. The Garden of Eden is only part of the answer. It wasn't the only rebellion. There were other rebellions that occurred. Spiritual, rebelling, interconnected with the physical. And these were the catalysts for all of the things that are going on in our lives to this very day. And if we understand it, if we get a, a foundation of understanding, then we'll be able to more easily identify when it's happening and when we're being drawn into it. So I'm not, I'm not giving the information just to give information. I want us as the family of God, as the church to identify when we're getting sucked in to the spiritual temptation of rebellion. And it happens all the time. I catch myself all the time. I've studied this stuff for years. It's one of my passions. And I still get sucked into it all the time. I want you to understand, the garden was the first rebellion. Genesis 3 talks all about it. The serpent came to Eve, tempted her in the garden. We we're all aware of the story. Did eat of the fruit, the one that God said you can eat of all the trees in the garden except for this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent came and tempted Eve. And Adam stood there going, oh, let's see what happens. When he was told to be the head of his household, but he stood there and watched. And she took, and she gave some to her husband who was there, and they both partook of the fruit, not an apple. So it was just a fruit. I don't think the fruit exists, but people say apple all the time, not an apple, just a fruit. And they ate of that fruit, and though there wasn't anything magical within the fruit itself, the rebellion against God, there may have been some components in, in it, I don't want to say definitively, but... Their rebellion against God was human rebellion, sin, selfishness. I want to be, I want to know, I want to have all the knowledge, all the information, just like God. That was the temptation. I want to know all the stuff. I want to be like him. I want to be like them. And this selfish, envious Rebellion, temptation began, okay? Now, this curse that came to, on mankind and on the earth was the result was a, was, the result of this rebellion was a curse. It was spiritual and physical because death came into the world. Both spiritual and physical death began at that point. And that was the result of that first rebellion. Now, we want to talk a little bit here about the enemy, about the serpent that came in. This is Ezekiel. This is where we, we figure out about cherubs. Ezekiel 28, 13 through 17. 
when God's talking to the king of Tyre, but quickly turns it over and starts speaking right to the serpent, right to the devil. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And it goes through the whole list, which I'm going to skip. Uh, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engraves, engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. He was the top anointed guardian cherub of the throne room of God. And now you'll understand why he thinks the way he thinks. I placed you. You were on the holy mount of God. That is talking about the council chamber in Eden, okay? Eden was God, wherever God is, that's where his council chamber uh, exists. He was there in Eden. He was in charge of that earthly council chamber where God came, where his council sat, okay? In the midst of the stones of fire, you walked. The stones of fire is a euphemism. It's Hebrew. I've gone into the whole thing. I'm not going to unpack it for you now, but it's talking about the council members, Okay, there are other spirit sons of God in the council. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, he goes back into the king of Tyre stuff, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. And now he goes back to this to Satan. So I cast you as, as a profane thing from the mount of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub. From the midst of the stones of fire. So he's cast out from the council. He's dismissed. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground or I cast you to the earth. That's, that's what Satan was doing there. And he was cast from the council. Now we have this rebellious cherub who hates everything about you and me because as God gave us dominion he thought he should have had dominion he was the anointed cherub for the garden and he thought this was his and he was given spiritual authority over the garden but man humans us you and me Adam and Eve were given physical dominion over the earth and you can see the clash. You can see where that would be a problem. And Satan's jealousy for mankind that God would care for you and me even more than, than the enemy, than Lucifer, than the devil who was supposed to be the anointed cherub to guard his throne room. He cast him out from the council no longer part of his holy council. This sent him into his rebellion and deception for mankind. Let me bring you to the second rebellion. That's the first one. The second rebellion is in Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. It says, when, when man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, remember that term, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for, for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. Not going to get into that number right now. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Okay, very confusing. Here's what happened. Man's multiplying in the earth. They're spreading out. They're out of the garden. They're growing. Lots of population. And then the sons of God, these are part of the council, saw that the daughters of men were attractive and came to them, married them, and had children with them. This is a genetic rebellion okay this is the rebelling 
spiritual beings, divine spiritual beings, rebelling against the plan of God, jealous because of how much he loves you and me, how much he loves humanity, that he wants us to be in his family, sit at his council table. They're so jealous that they want to make impure the genetic makeup of mankind. They want to inflict a genetic rebellion. Okay? The results of this are giants in the land, demonic spirits, and a lack of boundaries in the spiritual realm. The spiritual and the physical are now crossed over. And God said this was not supposed to happen. God had made a boundary, a verbal boundary, a command, that this boundary was not to be broken. Jude chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, this is information that ancient Israel knew. They understood it. On Wednesday night, we talk about this. You need to look at scriptures with ancient Hebrew eyes, okay? I didn't wear my glasses today, but Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority or within their own boundary, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Saul, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulge in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So this rebellion was genetic. It's sexual. It is uh, um, boundaries. Spiritual boundaries are crossed over. It is a rebellion against the boundaries that God had set up between humanity and the spirit realm. This has been, it's been marched over. And if you read the text, it didn't just happen before the flood, chapter 6, then the flood comes and destroys all of mankind. It happens again after the flood. They do it again. And this is why he put them away, because they kept violating that boundary. Okay? Now, you get an understanding you get Goliath coming up against Israel and David having to fight a giant. Why were there giants? This is why there were giants. This is why giants of great magnitude to Goliath was probably a small giant in comparison. But you want to understand when you're reading the Old Testament, when you're reading through and you go, why did he send them in to destroy everyone? Why did they kill everyone? This is why. There was a genetic rebellion that was making impure the very creation of God. And these were being eliminated because God loves humanity. God created us to be who we are, not to have something else infiltrate what God created. Why is God so, why is blood so important for God? It carries the genetic traits that God put into you and me. And when that was made impure, God went on a mission through his people to eliminate the impurity. Third rebellion, Babel. Okay, we come out of the flood. You get a, a, a genealogy from the three sons of, of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. You get a genealogy, and it goes through all the nations that were created out of there. So we have some time that's spent and there was about 70 or 72 nations that were named in chapter 10 of Genesis, depending on how you read it. Some of them were sub-nations, about 70 nations that were, came out of Shem, Ham, and Japheth after we went to the flood. I know this is a whirlwind tour. Hang with me, okay? It's all going to come together. Genesis 11, right after that naming of all the nations, Genesis 11, we get the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated 
from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. This is the uh, Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia um, the Fertile Crescent, if you will, at the time. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one. They are one people. And they have all one language. And this is, the o- this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there, confuse their languages, so they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them all over the face of the earth. Now, I know that that's a lot of information. I'm going to give you some basic understanding. This was a rebellion of worship. Okay? This started a rebellion of worship. It was a rebellion of worship. They were building a tower. They were building a tower of worship. Not to worship God, but a worship that they would create on their own. How many people do you know that have created this whole religion in their own head, in their own heart, in their own mind, and they chase after those religion? That's where this began, in Babel. This is that rebellion. It's a rebellion of worship. We have a human sin rebellion, we have a genetic rebellion, and we have a rebellion of worship. And the the ramifications, the result of that was idolatry, Division of people, rejection of nations, and international chaos. Okay? And what happened there, Deuteronomy 32 8 gives us a clarification of what God did there. And it's not always easy to understand or find, but Deuteronomy 32 8 said, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations, like I told you. Ancient Hebrew eyes, they understood this right away. We don't get this, but we should start looking at Scripture this way. Ask your father, and he will show you your elders, and they will tell you when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. When he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the numbers of the sons of God. Okay? When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, what did he give them? Hang on a second. When he divided mankind, how did he divide them? Through languages. This is what they're talking about. That point in time. When he divided mankind. He fixed the borders of the people so they couldn't talk to each other according to the numbers of the sons of God. So the number that rebelled against God, he gave each nation a, one of the sons of God over them. You, wanna, you don't want to worship me? I'll give you one of the sons of God. You worship one of the sons of God. And the sons of God, their mission was to point them back to Jesus. That was their mission. And they rebelled against him. And they created worship for themselves. And they began to lead the nations of the earth. Now you understand why there's so much international conflict in geopolitical battles is because there is a geographic spiritual battle going on where these rebelling sons of God are over all of these other nations and they are at war not just against God but against each other as well. They want the worship for themselves. Why do we have so many religions in the world? Because these sons of God are calling worship on themselves, trying to rob the creator of the world, the creator of the universe, the creator of all things, of the worship that is due him. And we get caught up in it because we think it's all about politics and international politics, but it's not. It's all about the rebellion 
of the sons of God against the nations. When Jesus was on earth, he sent out disciples two by two. How many did he send? Seventy in some translations, 72. They went to all of the places where they were divided, every single one of them. You want to look at the Bible through ancient Hebrew eyes. All the puzzle pieces come together when you understand Jesus came to restore all the nations. He sent his disciples out to all of those nations because he was saying the kingdom of God is at hand was the message that he gave them to send. He didn't, he didn't go and say, teach them the gospel. They went and said the kingdom of God is at hand. Why did they say that? Because these people, these sons of God, thought that they were the owners of their own kingdom. And God's saying, all right, it's begun. I'm taking humanity back. And it starts right here by going up against all these rebelling sons of God. And he started taking it back. And God, in chapter 12, the very next chapter, right after chapter 11, right after Babel, he calls a fresh new people to himself. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, he calls Abram, who will be Abraham, and creates a whole new nation, not on that list in chapter 10, not anywhere on the list. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, do you have that one? There it is. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from the country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be blessed. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he called Abraham out from those nations, those rebelling nations who were worshiping other gods. And he said, you will be a blessing. And you will bless all the nations because through you, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send Jesus. And he is going to restore all things. He's going to bring the kingdom back in. A nation, he calls out a new nation. He calls a nation to be a blessing. And he calls a nation to purify the other nations. Calling people away from that worship to come and worship the one true God. And a nation to reveal God's laws. And by doing that, he's revealing God's heart. The heart of God is revealed through Israel. The very heart of God. You wonder why the Ten Commandments start off with, you shall have no other gods before me. It's because of the rebellion. Where they were worshiping everything else but God. He says, you will not make for yourself any graven image. Because there was idols that were being worshipped. Not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The name of the Lord is Jesus. That's an identification to Jesus. Don't take that name lightly. When you call on the name of the Lord, when you call on Jesus as Lord and Savior, don't do that lightly because he's not asking you to just say a prayer. He's asking you to surrender your heart and your life to him. That's what he's asking. That's how you become part of the family of God is by a full surrender of everything you are, everything you have. To Jesus Christ. See, the Bible lays out the mission for us. The Bible, the mission, and you and me. And it's all part of what we are called to do. See, because people are looking for answers. They want to know why all this stuff's going on. They want to know where to turn. People are looking for purpose in life. People are looking for a family because God created people to be part of family. He created us in family, using family, with family, so we could identify that we need to be part of a family, a spiritual family, the family of God. This is what we try to do at Life Coast Church, create the atmosphere of family because then you'll find your purpose Within this earthly realm, not just for now, but for forever. You get that? God doesn't want to just save you for eternity. He wants to save you for your best life here. And I'm not Joel Osteen. 
He wants you to save you so you can live in peace. No matter what's going on around you, you're going to walk in peace because you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know the one who defeated all of these rebellions. He came and put them all to shame through what he did. The rebellions came to cause death and destruction. And Jesus pulled the greatest bait and switch that eternity has ever seen. He said, you want death and destruction? I'll come and I'll die and let my temple be destroyed. You'll think you've won, but then I will rise again and conquer sin and death. And I will defeat every rebellion you've ever thrown. The enemy rules through death, but Jesus conquered death. And if we get an understanding of that, that Christ just doesn't, he wants us for eternity. Absolutely. Amen. Hallelujah. It's going to be glorious. But he wants something for us now in this life. He wants us to have the human experience with him, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that we can go just like those 70. Say, the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is advancing. And he's using our family to advance that kingdom. I'm going to end with this. This is kind of the theme for our whole series. And in the weeks to come, you're going to hear more and more about how to battle against these things. I just laid the groundwork for you. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present, this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. When you're in conflict, with your spouse. Yeah, it might be because you said something stupid or you left the toilet seat up or whatever. It might be because of that. But look at it from with spiritual eyes first. As a husband, what have I done to not lead my family well that might be frustrating my wife? As a wife, how am I not supporting my husband and respecting him well. That might be frustrating. At work, you might be have a boss that doesn't know Christ as Savior. I had one of those and he frustrated me no end. But are you advancing the kingdom of God in that place? Doing your job to the best of your ability with a heart of peace, with words of truth and hope changes everything when you realize your battle is not against flesh and blood the next time you're yelling at the television because of the news and I do that my wife asked me why are you yelling at the television like I said I study this stuff I don't get it perfect but I can identify it and I can say that rebellion the rebellion of the nations is playing itself out right before us and we can't get ourselves sucked into that we need to speak truth we need to profess the kingdom we need to advance the kingdom and let me tell you something when I get myself there after a few you know yelling at the television when I finally get myself there peace comes over me and I was saying the victory is going to happen. Even if it gets worse before it gets better, Christ is coming back. Jesus is on his throne. He is calling his people. He does want us to respond. And let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you to stand up. Let me ask you this. Are you in a place where you're struggling in relationships with your job, with your family, with your people? 
I want to pray for you. I want to help everyone to understand this, this battle. Just come on down and join me right here. I'm going to just pray for anyone who comes down. We're just going to pray together because we want to get you to understand this battle is all about the enemy trying to get us away from the kingdom. Kingdom thinking. He wants us to have worldly thinking. But we're called to have kingdom thinking. We're called to be a light. We're called to make a difference. We're called to be part of his family. We are a redeemed people. We shouldn't still be struggling against flesh and blood. We should be rejoicing in the spirit. Can I get a good amen on that? Worship team's going to lead us.